Welcome to CyberCast, decoding today's cyber issues. I'm Alexander Boliba, production lead at GovCIO Media and Research. With me today is deputy editor, Kate Macri. Hi, Kate. Hi, Alex. So you had the opportunity to chat with Brian Campo, deputy CIO at the U.S. Coast Guard. Before we jump into that conversation, was there any big news that came out of the interview? Yes, thank you for asking. Coast Guard Deputy CIO Brian Campo told me that he expects the Coast Guard to launch its own software factory this year. It'll be their first one. And it's really interesting and exciting because Coast Guard is not technically part of DOD. It's kind of in this weird space straddling like DHS and DOD. They share DOD network infrastructure, but they're technically part of the Department of Homeland Security. So it's interesting that they're following DOD's lead on this, I guess technically the Air Force's lead, and setting up their own software factory. So that's really exciting news. Wow. Yeah, that is really exciting. What was the most surprising thing that you learned? So I think one of the most surprising things or interesting things that I heard from Campo during our interview is that the concept of the continuous authorization to operate or Cato, which has been kind of trendy in the DoD community for the last year, especially ever since that Cato memo came out last year, early last year, saying, you know, they wanted all of DoD to move toward this continuous authorization to operate where you're continually making sure technology is meeting security requirements rather than just signing off once every three years on uh, technology, whether that's IT or OT. And he said Cato is one of the largest things they've got going for software development, and that is really key to launching a software factory and moving away from long cycles of development with security at the end. And he said that that's really like the linchpin of securely and quickly developing new software. And I thought that was interesting because, I mean, that may seem kind of obvious. So maybe it sounds dumb for me to say that was the most surprising thing that I learned, but I never really thought about it that way before as Cato being the, you know, that really important thing that allows you to do what a software factory does, which is really accelerate the production cycle to get new software into people's hands much faster. But it makes sense, especially when you think about it from a security perspective. Did Campo hit on any buzzwords or well-known cyber trends? So we definitely talked about zero trust. I feel like that happens in every interview on this podcast. I always have a question about zero trust. I always want to know what people think about it. So we definitely talked about that. And Campo has a really interesting perspective on zero trust because, you know, DHS was really the first federal agency to start adopting zero trust or implementing it or whatever word you want to use. I know people have strong opinions over what word you use to describe doing zero trust. (laughs) Anyway, he was one of the first people really at the forefront of zero trust adoption before it became like this really big buzzword, like before the executive order on implementing zero trust that Biden signed in May 2021. So he has this really interesting perspective on zero trust and what that looks like at the Coast Guard, especially now that DOD has released its five-year zero trust strategy. So he has this, yeah, he has a really interesting perspective on it, like with his DHS experience and with this collaboration with DOD. So I really enjoyed that bit of the conversation. He also talked about 5G and 5G security. Uh, 5G is a really big opportunity for the Coast Guard, and he he really breaks down why 5G is so important to the Coast Guard. Um, so that was a really interesting conversation as well. And then the other thing, I'm not sure if this is technically considered a buzzword in cybersecurity. I think it's a trend in cybersecurity, the concept of data readiness being foundational to cybersecurity, like moving security boundaries out from the application to making security about evaluating every request per every 
connection to the network. And he said, I mean, he considers data like a pillar of zero trust and data tagging and knowing what you have before you can protect it and being like the quintessential first step. Well, with that, let's listen to your interview. To start off our conversation today, can you discuss your top three cybersecurity priorities for 2023 at the Coast Guard? Sure. So first, Kate, I really appreciate you having me. It's uh, it's always good to try and get uh, get the good word out on the Coast Guard and what we're doing from an IT and a security perspective. You know, when we think about 2023 from a cybersecurity perspective for the Coast Guard, there's a few things that come to mind. It's easy to start with things like zero trust or increasing our security posture, but I'm trying to think a little bit more strategically um, and, and trying to think about how cybersecurity can can really benefit us as we take on some new roles in the Coast Guard. As we we think about the Coast Guard sort of you know embracing more of a global posture and and taking on some some non traditional activities, uh, I, I try to think about things like gaining visibility into our security. You know, from a security Implementation perspective, that looks like a security incident event manager, um, you know, giving us visibility into what's going on in our network, where some of our network traffic is coming from. Uh, as we, you know, we start to look at other um, outlets for security, it becomes really important to understand exactly where, uh, you know, where data is coming from, where it's going. Um, the second piece is really just reforming the way that we think about risk. You know, for us, that looks like things like changing the way that we do our authority to operate. Um, we're trying to move away from, you know, long cycles of development that end with security uh, evaluations at the very end and trying to bring them into our development processes. So thinking about uh, doing security testing when we're doing deployments, thinking about security testing when we're doing uh, commits to repositories, working with our vendors on, um, you know, very specific uh, sort of deployment platforms that we're trying to implement. So thinking about our, our risk assessment, our risk management, and then being deliberate about how we manage our security posture. So rather than taking security by default or, you know, maybe assuming a piece of risk because we, we, we need to get a system out, um, just being more deliberate, understanding where we're taking risk and understanding what that risk means. And then I would say, finally, understanding how security affects our user experience. Um, you know, we're, we're constantly putting new clients on our computers or putting new uh, security gateways in place that, that can degrade our operators, our mission performers, um, the, the performance aspects of that. So I've challenged our folks as we're bringing in new security to, to, to take the opportunity to think about how we're delivering our services and try to make sure that security is uh, as much of an enabler as it is a, a sort of protector. That's a great way to start the conversation. There's a lot to unpack in there. Before I move on to my next question, I had a follow-up question actually about you mentioned changing the ATO process, moving away from long development cycles. Does the continuous ATO approach play into kind of what you're thinking for 2023? Yeah, absolutely. So that that is uh, probably one of the largest things that we've got going on with uh, how we're going to start deploying software. So we're looking at a multi-fold approach. You know, Software factories are sort of the hot new thing in for us in the government. I know industry has been doing it for years, but um, we're making a big push into getting software deployment, uh, software factory deployments, uh, getting landing zones so we know what we're deploying onto, having consistent frameworks. All of that together kind of gives us an opportunity to uh, reassess the way that we do ATOs. So bringing ATO cycles from you know every three years to doing mini ATO reviews on every single deployment looking at things that help us get capability out quicker, like uh, certification to field, um, which is sort of an interim uh, for an ATO. Uh, and then looking at you know connection agreements, all those sorts of things that, that give us more security capability in less time, but with the same risk posture. So is the Coast Guard looking to launch its own software factory? Uh, so we're looking at it from a twofold approach. Uh, one is, yes, we are looking at trying to put out a software factory. We're going to okay. use that sort of like a reference implementation of like what we want uh, to mm -hmm. be our landing zones, our, our sort of deployment targets. We'll do some deployment into our own software factory. But the other thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to give that to industry. So industry knows what they're building to. So they have a, a sort of you know set of containers that they know we're going to use. Um, they know what our landing zone in AWS is. They know what our 
our landing zone in, in Azure is. Uh, and, and so that will give us a little bit more of a sort of interface agreement with our vendors. Um, and then it has huge benefits as we try to try to move to continuous ATO. Yeah, absolutely. That's really cool. Do you have a timeline for that or is it still kind of in the beginning stages? Yeah, I, we have been working on our software factory for about maybe six to eight months now. Okay. Um, it is definitely something that we see happening in 2023. Okay. Uh, we've, we've done some internal deployments on it. We're, we're starting to put together sort of a reference architecture for what our landing zones are going to look like, for what our software factory is going to look like, what our deployment targets are going to look like. Um, and, you know, sometime in 23, I think we'll start looking at trying to deploy some things out to that. And then uh, we've already started engaging some of our vendors, uh, some of our industry partners on, uh, you know, giving us feedback on those as well as, you know, what their thoughts are on, on uh, being able to deploy to them. That's awesome. That's really cool news. So we cover software factories quite a bit. So it's always very exciting to hear about new ones popping up, especially for you guys, because I think this would be your first one. So moving on a little bit, what role does data readiness play in your cybersecurity strategy, especially when it comes to a software factory? What role does it play there, especially from like a cyber perspective? I would start by saying from a, you know, from a data readiness play, it is really important from cybersecurity because it's sort of foundational to the way cybersecurity needs to move, which is, you know, moving those security boundaries out from the applications and the network into more of per request, per connection. Um, and so, you know, we just stood up our Office of Data and Analytics, which is where our CDO lives for the Coast Guard. Um, and so coordinating with them on things like data tagging, um, getting our, our data warehouses in play, making sure that as our as our data folks are building up these large data platforms, that they're thinking about security from the beginning, um, and then from zero trust, right? So one of the pillars of zero trust is the data is the uh, the data pillar, which means getting data tagging done, so you know what data is being requested, and then you can start bringing policies into play. So um, you can you can uh, move from a you know sort of per connection basis or per application basis for your security to really very granular. Uh, security requests um, and you know being able to apply policies at the data layer, I think, is where we want to be. We've got a lot of work to get there, um, but that's that's sort of where we see data being able to play from a cybersecurity perspective. And then the other piece of it is just um, having these data platforms so that we can crunch huge amounts of data security information. Right? We talk about our mm -hmm. incident and event management. That's a lot of data coming into this. Um, yeah. Understanding that data, being able to have data platforms where we can understand where we can evaluate it, we have visibility into that, um, all of that plays. So I think data is a huge frontier for us from a security perspective. Yeah, definitely. So 5G has been a pretty big effort at the Coast Guard lately. And I know you've talked about that a little bit. How are you accounting for known and unknown potential cybersecurity risks associated with 5G? I'll start by saying that I think 5G provides a huge opportunity for the Coast Guard. You know, when yeah. you think about the, the geographic diversity of where Coast Guard facilities are, um, how we operate as the Coast Guard, we're in uh, remote areas quite often, um, places where, you know, sometimes we're on tribal lands where we can't bring fiber in to connect a, a location. Uh, we might have a boat station that, that is nowhere near where uh, we need to get connectivity. So 5G provides a huge opportunity for us to bring connectivity to those locations. You know, putting a, a boat out in the Great Lakes, um, you know, being close to the coast, they can get a 5G connection where, you know, they may have had to use uh, high frequency radios or things like that. So it is a huge enabler for us from a, from a connectivity perspective. Um, but as you mentioned, there are a lot of cybersecurity challenges that come from that. I will say first and foremost, it's a different paradigm for us. Um, and especially from a government where we, we generally own end to end the connectivity. Uh, you know, we, we're on our own fiber, we're, we're connected to our own facilities. We've mm -hmm. made those connections in a 5G world. We don't have that anymore, right? We're, we're dependent mm -hmm. on our, our industry partners, our vendors to, to manage that first leg, that, that sort of last mile logistics of our, uh, of our connectivity. So it's a different mechanism for us. There are also some IT uh, supply chain risk management perspectives that, that you need to have when you're thinking about 5G. Um, and then the last piece of it really is around you know, degradation of networks, degradation of connectivity. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, especially in a threat environment. Um, you know, Coast Guard doesn't spend a lot of time in high threat environments, but we, we do have those challenges. Um, whether, you know, breaking down those connections, it, I see us being a more effective Coast Guard because 5G is available to us, but we have to think about how it changes our operational posture. And, and as much as I'm excited about 5G, I think it is a challenge for us to change the way that we uh, manage and implement our IT to take that into account. Yeah, for sure. So kind of piggybacking on something that you were mentioning there about the supply chain, you said that the IT supply chain and IT supply chain risks can keep you up at night. Can you dive into your concerns around the IT supply chain or concerns around the 5G supply chain and how you're working to mitigate those vulnerabilities in your role at the Coast Guard? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I will say um, I think most CIOs put IT supply chain risk management into their keep them up at night category. Um, really? I talked to several CIOs who, who actually reached out to me after that comment and said, uh, you know, you, you nailed it. Um, yeah. I, I think it has to do with a couple of things. One is it's completely out of our control. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we can evaluate supply chain risk management, and we're, we're building frameworks to do that. We're, we're getting tools to do that. But when you think about a vendor that does not have their own supply chain risk management, that, isn't, that doesn't understand the entire provenance of their uh, the code, you know, and we think about it in terms of hardware and chips, but mm -hmm. it also happens in the software side too. So, yeah. so you might leverage a um, an open source component in your application. Um, and I'm a huge fan of open source, but I, I think when you are not aware of the logistical risks um, that that having an external component come into your uh, into your application suite provides, um, it can open up a lot of gateways for you know, everything from malware to, uh, you know, actual attacks to sometimes just degradation of application capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, we are all looking at, uh, you know, sort of the componentization of IT, the, the commoditization of IT. And I think mm -hmm. we're going to have much more disparate logistical chains for IT. I, and I think this is why, you know, uh, NIST uh, is putting out frameworks for supply chain man risk management. Uh, OMB, from a government perspective, has put out some requirements for us to think about supply chain risk management. And when you think about it as the risk official for the organization, you know, we have to consider that. Um, yeah. Some of the things we're trying to do there, um, like I said, we're bringing on some tools to help us with that. We're bringing on some uh, information providers. So there's a, a sort of cottage industry of information providers that, that are looking at these things. It looks a lot like zero-day vulnerabilities, but they're helping us understand where components are coming from. And you know, where uh, a second or third order supplier of a, a component might be. Um, and then I think we've just got to get better. We talked about continuous ATO, right? So, you know, looking at our, looking at things as we bring them in rather than waiting until we do a, you know, a new release, um, doing an evaluation of a new piece of software that we bring into our development tool chains at the time that we do it um, helps quite a bit with things like, you know, everybody knows SolarWinds and Log4j, but I think there's a there is also the capability to address that a lot more granularly than uh, maybe we have in the past. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like open source software and you know all of the issues associated with the open source software supply chain that'll probably become a bigger focus for you guys with software factories and launching your own software factory. Is that something that's kind of top of mind for you? Yeah, I, I will. I will just sort of clarify the point. I think um, we would not be able to do a software factory without open source, right? So open okay. source is, is absolutely integral. Um, and I know that you know we, we we look at open source software sometimes with a little bit of of uh, worry, but I do mm -hmm. think you know we use open, we use so much open source. I think it just changes the way we have to evaluate it, right? You right. know, when we don't own the logistical chain, um, and we you know we're we're leveraging software from vendors that we don't have a first person relationship with. Um, mm -hmm. I think we just have to think about it differently and we have to consider uh, a, a different sort of evaluation mentality with that. You know, with Software Factory, absolutely. I think, you know, we've, we've made a huge investment in Software Factory at, um, you know, commit level testing. So we're doing security testing at every commit, uh, or at least that's what we'll be doing when we get to Software Factory. Um, we're gonna have testing pipelines, we're going to be managing, um, you know, some some security testing, uh, getting reports out. We're going to start putting in place 
you know, things like um, infrastructure as code so that we can do evaluations of configuration management. I think those things together help us to mitigate those risks. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, absolutely. We have to think about security differently um, when we're thinking about not having that direct relationship that, you know, sort of, you know, not a vendor that we can go and, and query when, uh, you know, when we're not sure what something means or when we see something we're not familiar with in the code. We're going to take a break from today's interview and play a game I call Archive Deep Dive, where I challenge our hosts to identify a previous guest on our podcast. Playing today are Deputy Editor Kate Macri and Staff Writer Researcher Nikki Henderson. Hi, Kate. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Alex. Hi there, Alex. Here are the rules. I will play a clip from one of our previous podcasts, and if you know the answer, buzz in using a buzzword. Today's buzzword is zero trust. If you get it wrong, the other player gets a chance to guess. If neither of you get the answer, I open the floor to random guessing until somebody gets it right, or I get impatient and just tell you. And as a quick editor's note, yes, I am editing down the response time Otherwise, you would be listening to a lot of silence and not a lot of game. Thank you. There are three clips today. Are you ready? I hope so. I think so. <laughs> All right. Here's the first clip. I came into this career in sort of an odd way. Uh, first off, I started out in... Uh, in the creative realm in advertising and design. And I did that for about 20 years, but I always had a passion for computer programming. Her voice sounds really familiar. Uh, I'm having trouble with this one. <laughs> I think she's someone in DOD. Am I right? Am I close, that is, Alex? That is correct, yes. That is correct? Okay, 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 okay. Um, that, that definitely helps me, hold on. Um, I think this was someone that I interviewed. Maybe? Uh, is it Kelly Kiernan? It is not. Nikki, would you like to guess? Well, unfortunately, that voice doesn't even sound familiar to me. So <laughs> I'm, I'm at a loss right now. Sorry, Alex, Kate. <laughs> well, your hint is that this guest was our last Cybercast interview of 2022. Ah, Melissa Weiss. Yes, even without the buzzword, I will take that. Melissa Weiss, Director, Vulnerability Disclosure Program, DOD Cybercrime Center. On to our next clip. Yeah, but information sharing is a, is a great term of art, and it's always been something that has been valuable. Um, it's always been aspirational that we would share information that would be useful. Emphasis on the term useful. Oh, I know who this is. Unless you do, Nikki. No, I don't. I thought I did, but I don't think so. It's the soon-to-be former first national cyber director, Chris Inglis. Yes, that is correct. Chris Inglis, the soon-to-be former cyber director. All right, our last clip. At the end of the day, I want to baseline the cyber priorities and ensure that we are aligned with the overarching priorities of the department. I know who this is too. Do you have a buzzword? Mm, is this supposed to be a buzzword from the episode? No, you just have to say zero trust. You're buzzing in. Oh, right. Zero trust. <laughs> yes, Kate. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm totally doing this wrong. <laughs> um, is it Wanda Jones Heath? Principal Cyber Advisor for the Department of the Air Force? Yes, it is. Wanda Jones Heath, CISO and Principal Cyber Advisor for the Air Force. Kate, congratulations. You have won this round. Uh, anything you'd like to say? Do I get a prize? Uh, the prize is knowledge. Great. That's what I've always wanted. Congratulations, All right, well, Kate. 
You won by a landslide. <laughs> Well, Nikki, you can always come back for a chance at revenge. But for now, that is all for Archive Deep Dive. And we are going to go back to the episode. So I want to change gears a little bit because I'm interested in hearing a little more from you about zero trust, which you know, has been a big buzzword across federal government for the last couple of years now. And, you know, the Coast Guard is technically part of DHS, which is a department that I think is considered one of the first adopters of zero trust in a lot of ways, or at least, you know, one of the first agencies to really talk about it a lot. But, you know, the Coast Guard also shares some like overlap with DOD. You're kind of like caught in the middle there. And, you know, DOD just put out their own five year zero trust strategy. So I'm interested in kind of where you stand in terms of philosophy and your vision for implementing zero trust, if that's a goal this year and what that adoption journey kind of looks like. Yeah. It is, it is quite interesting, right? You mentioned sort of caught in the middle. I like to think of it as being able to leverage the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, so I, I, uh, I came to uh, the Coast Guard from DHS where I was a CTO. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things I did when I got there uh, around 2019 was we started our zero trust strategy, right? So we started with a strategy, we put out a roadmap, then we put out a reference architecture. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so as you said, zero trust has been uh, deep in the heart of DHS for a while, and they've had mm -hmm. a lot of time to work on it. Um, yeah. So luckily, I come with that experience, right? I, I, mm -hmm. I sort of led the, the department's move. So I was able to kind of hit the ground running uh, with Zero Trust from a Coast Guard perspective. Um, so, so we certainly are going to leverage what DHS has put in place, um, you know, both fundamentally uh, in, in the roadmap and the strategy, but also, you know, there are there are some elements of zero trust that DHS has had in place for a couple of years now. Um, and so we're certainly leveraging some of those. We've got some vendors that are doing, you know, policy enforcement points, uh, policy decision points. You know, we, we've got uh, arrangements at all the peering locations for our traffic to be managed. Um, so we've got some of those things that we're leveraging right now. But as you mentioned, we also have a DOD component. And it's interesting when you consider both of those, because from a DHS perspective, we have to be compliant with DHS because we're, we are a component of DHS, but we right. operate on the DOD network. Um, so we mm. have to be fully implemented to the DOD standards, that five-year roadmap that you talked about. Um, you know, there's about 80, 80 or so uh, specific implementation details that have to, to be uh, you know, compliant or fully implemented on the DOD zero trust strategy. Um, wow. It is, it is certainly a challenge um, when you consider, you know, having to meet two levels of compliance. Um, luckily, they are generally interoperable, I would say. Um, you know, where, where DHS might be doing something a certain way, uh, D, DOD has more of a general standards of how you have to do it. So I, I do like to think of it as the best parts of what DHS is doing, we're definitely going to take those and implement them. And then where DOD has maybe a more stringent standard, it kind of just forces us to up our game and be a little bit more secure. Um, and then, you know, from a DOD perspective, I think it's really helpful for us because that sort of pushes industry to now think about zero trust. Um, and, and it kind of requires industry to up their game and bring better products to play because they know that there's a market, right? So they know right. that, you know, the, the multi-billion dollar IT machine that is the DOD is going to make investments in security. So I think it just, it brings industry along for the ride and has them uh, thinking about products a little bit differently. So, you know, we're obviously a benefactor of that where we don't have the billions of dollars in IT to spend. Um, we get to take advantage of a lot of what DOD is kind of pushing industry to do. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that interwoven with both DHS and DOD for you guys um, from a zero trust perspective. So that's very interesting. What would you say you feel like really sets you up for success based on your past experience as CTO for DHS from a zero trust perspective? Uh, so I, I will start with having to build out a roadmap and a reference architecture when there really wasn't a lot available. Um, you have, yeah. Luckily, the CIO at the time was he was uh, you know, very visionary and, and he really saw zero trust as it was going to be the way all security was done. Um, so he kind of pushed us to head down that road. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, you know, fundamental understanding, um, not being tied into a certain vendor's ecosystem, because there was no there was no end to end vendor in 2019 for zero trust. Right. There was there was different pieces that were being provided by certain vendors. So you really had to understand if you took this piece from vendor A and this piece from vendor B, how do you integrate those? How do you build out, um, you know, a, a, a multi vendor, multi solution enterprise architecture for zero trust? when nothing like that existed. So, you know, it definitely helps me understand the fundamentals of what we're trying to do from a zero trust perspective, but it also just having seen an implementation or two, you start to understand what you're, what you're really trying to do. And it helps you cut through the noise of, um, you know, the, the hype cycle or, uh, you know, some of the challenges that, that um, you hear about in the news for zero trust. It, it's not, it's not a technical challenge. It's a mental challenge. You have to change right. the way you think about zero trust. And, um, I think that mental perspective is really what I got by being involved so early in Zero Trust was just understanding that it fundamentally changes it from a, you know, a sort of protect a boundary, a, a um, you know, managing your security posture to, you don't manage your security posture anymore. You manage individual requests, you manage individual requirements. You have to manage every piece of it with a, with a different perspective of, um, you know, how do we, how do we qualify a request? How do we manage a request? How do we instrument a request so that we can tell if something's abnormal? Um, you know, just those sorts of things were really helpful getting involved so early. Yeah, I've heard multiple times that Zero Trust is really about a, a mindset and a culture shift. So it sounds like you're a couple steps ahead of pretty much everyone else when it comes to that, uh, just because of your past experience with DHS. So that's really cool. Yeah, it, does, it, it doesn't right. make it any easier. You just maybe understand it a little bit better. Right, right. So my last question for you before we finish up here is about satellite cybersecurity because connectivity and satellite communications are pretty important for the Coast Guard and for executing your mission. And satellite cybersecurity in particular has come to the forefront of government IT news following the war in Ukraine. So I'm curious about your priorities around satellite cybersecurity and what your concerns are in this area going forward. Yeah, satellite is very similar to 5G and it is a huge mission enabler for us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we talked a little bit about satellite connectivity being, you know, very low bandwidth and, and you know, 5G providing some of that additional bandwidth. I think the same thing is happening in the satellite world where, you know, previous uh, HF, UHF, VHF uh, radios had very limited connectivity. And now we've got, you know, low Earth orbit satellite providers that are bringing 100 meg, 150 meg globally. And that's that's a huge enabler for us from our mission, especially as we, we try to bring more data out to our platforms. The The other piece of it is that, you know, we're becoming more and more of a global Coast Guard. So, you know, the Coast Guard is doing operations in the South Pacific, um, in the South China Sea. We're doing we're doing operations in, or, you know, around the Horn of Africa. We're doing Antarctic operations, Arctic operations. So, you know, if there's a place in the globe where, uh, you know, things are happening, the Coast Guard's there, whether it's looking at fisheries, manage, you know, looking at illegal fishing or, you are know, just trying to help, um, you know, sovereign nations manage their, their coast better. Um, and, you know, providing that global support that, that we do, it forces us to operate in places where there are not traditional satellite communications. Arctic operations are a good example of that. And when there are those, uh, those operations, they're very, very low bandwidth and they're intermittent. You know, the new satellite providers provide us a really interesting opportunity. Um, but, you know, again, just like we talked about with 5G, you don't own the end-to-end -end connectivity anymore. And so things like zero trust become much more important. It's, it's absolutely critical that we start thinking about um, security at the connection level rather than at the, the boundary or the domain level, um, that we get the right data to the right platforms at the right time. You know, there, are, there are certainly challenges of supply chain when it comes to satellite providers. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they're building for, for commercial requirements. They're not necessarily building for government requirements. Um, you mentioned that we've seen you know, some challenges with some satellite providers you know, the other piece that really concerns me is the ability to degrade those networks, um, you know, whether it be through, you know, things like jamming or, or even just weather, um, you know, managing that connectivity as we as we make our fleet more connected um, on a on a full time basis, we become more dependent on those connections. And so um, I think mitigation has to take multiple forms. One is we have to continue to be able to operate in a resilient manner. 
Um, you know, we we have the opportunity to push more data to our, our cutters and our platforms, um, which means we can do security updates. Uh, you know, we can do things we couldn't do before unless they were in port. Um, we can push the right data to folks at the right time. Um, but I think we also have to manage that a lot better. We have to we have to continue to to operate. Um, you know, with the with the understanding that we could lose connectivity, um, and then you know all the things that we talked about for supply chain risk management, right? We've got to make sure that we understand the tools that we're putting on our boats. We need to make sure that we're we're understanding the connectivity that um, that we're providing, and mm-hmm. um, you know just managing the the uh, deployed capabilities that we're putting on those boats, so that we make sure that we're we're keeping them aligned with the connectivity that we can offer them. Awesome. Well, I don't have any more questions for you today. Was there anything else that you wanted to add or provide any additional details on before we finish up? No, I, Kate, I appreciate it. It was a really interesting yeah. conversation. I, I really enjoyed it. And I always, uh, I always relish the chance to kind of reach out into community. So I appreciate, you know, bringing me on and giving me access to your, to your listeners. Um, you know, IT and the Coast Guard is a really interesting place to be right now. I'm mm-hmm. extremely excited. I, like I said, I've been here uh, officially about seven months, but I was here for, you know, maybe, uh, about another eight or nine months before that on detail from headquarters. Um, and just looking at what we're doing in it in the coast guard is, is such an interesting place. Um, you know, I would certainly say that security is, is one of those areas where we're making huge strides. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're also looking for, you know, both industry and talent, um, you know, to help us along that way. Um, you know, we're, we're making, uh, a lot of pushes in, in trying to um, increase the level of, of security capability that we have from, you know, both offensive and defensive cyber. And so, you know, making sure that we get qualified people in those roles. So we're always looking for uh, IT professionals that want to help, uh, help join and serve with the Coast Guard. Before we wrap up the episode, Kate, are there any last takeaways that you want to leave our listeners with? The big takeaways from this interview were, one, Coast Guard's getting a software factory. That's pretty exciting. Two, IT supply chain risk management is a really big priority for all federal CIOs right now. And I think it's something that we don't necessarily talk about very often because risk management is such a nebulous thing, especially when you're talking about supply chain risk management, because that necessarily means that you can't really control everything that's going on in your supply chain all the time because you have all these different vendors and moving pieces and um, different federal agencies you might work with. And it's just, it's a little harder. And then managing the risk around what you're expecting other people to do or what they might not do, or like, you know, what your developers are doing, like that's, that's really hard to do. And I think that's something that I don't really see a lot of other news outlets talking about very often. And I think that's a pretty important topic and something we should be talking about more. So I would say that's a big takeaway. And then the final thing I would say is, you know, data is really important to zero trust. And that's something that we are consistently hearing. And that's something that I think also isn't really talked about very often in the zero trust conversation, like the importance of data management as a like prerequisite for zero trust. And that's something I would love to hear more about from people this year. Thank you so much, Kate. To get deep analysis and insider perspective on what's trending in federal cybersecurity, subscribe to and follow CyberCast and visit our website at govciomedia.com. We'll be back in two weeks for another episode. But until then, I'm Alexander Bolova. I'm Kate Macri. Thank you for listening. Cybercast, along with GovCast and HealthCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them on your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com. <laughs>